The bankruptcy clerk's office, with the assistance of local attorneys and the Chapter 13 trustee's office, prepared this short video on the model Chapter 13 plan that is used in this district. The intended audience for this video are attorneys who may be new to bankruptcy and their staff who may be called upon to file a Chapter 13 case. While the law allows an individual to file a Chapter 13 case on their own, this video should crystallize the realization, if not previously known, that an individual should not file a Chapter 13 case without the assistance of an attorney. Before beginning work on the Model Chapter 13 plan, you will need to have completed Schedules A, B, C, D, E, F, I, J, in Form 122C1, the Chapter 13 Statement of a Debtor's Current Income in Calculation of the Applicable Commitment Period to determine if the debtor is above or below the median income for the state of residence. For a Chapter 13 case, Director's Form B-2000 provides a list of required forms and schedules. The schedules are available on the uscourts.gov website by searching for Bankruptcy Form. Kelly Coder, an attorney in Bridgeport, Ohio, explains her strategy for completing the schedules and the first draft of the Chapter 13 plan. So typically before I file a bankruptcy for a client, I meet with them uh, at least three times. It's really important to get a whole view of their situation. You want to know everything about their assets, about their income, their expenses. You want to know what kind of debts they have. Are they drowning in tax debt? Is it just secured debt? student loans, everything like that. Uh, so you want to know how you're going to approach crafting the Chapter 13 plan. After we gather the information, my staff will type the information into Best Case, which is a bankruptcy software program. And then when the client's coming in to sign everything, I will check the petition against the our interview forms to make sure that the petition accurately reflects what they've told us during the interview process that we haven't left anything out. When you're approaching the plan for each um, each debtor, you have to think about what they're, why they're filing a 13. Is it because of too much income? Are they trying to save a house or a vehicle? Is it tax debt? That can kind of guide how you're going to approach the plan. So sometimes you have people that can do either a three-year plan or a five-year plan, and sometimes people want to opt to do the three-year plan so they can get out of bankruptcy as soon as possible. Other people would opt to do the five-year because they have a, a tighter budget and they'd prefer to have a lower monthly payment. And usually initially at the first time you have a good idea as to whether or not a plan is going to be feasible. You have to have income to do a 13. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be wage income. I've had people have, on pensions and social securities file with Chapter 13. It is hard sometimes if you have a client that comes in and they're trying to save a house or a vehicle and they just don't have the income and you want to help them but there's really no feasible way to do it. You know, I tell my clients I can make it work on paper but you have to make it work in real life but sometimes I know whatever I do on paper there's no way they can do it in real life and so that's really hard sometimes. The Chapter 13 plan is available on the court's website. Go to the Forms tab, Local Mandatory Forms, Chapter 13 Plan. In this video, we are going to work with the Excel version that is provided by the court. For the caption, insert the name of the debtor, and if you don't know the case number, leave it blank. Later, when the plan is attached to the notice of the date first set for the Chapter 13 confirmation hearing, the notice will have the appropriate case number. If you are amending a previously filed plan before it is confirmed, following the provided instructions, if it is not an amended plan, just skip this section. When the plan asks if the debtor has current monthly income above the applicable median income for the state, refer to Form 122C1. If the boxes are marked as indicated, write yes in the Chapter 13 plan. Otherwise, write no. When the form asks if the debtor is eligible for a Chapter 13 discharge, it is asking if the debtor filed a previous bankruptcy petition. If the debtor has not filed a previous bankruptcy petition, write yes. If the debtor has filed a previous bankruptcy petition, refer to 11 U.S.C. Section 1328F to determine the debtor's eligibility for a discharge in the current case. In Part 2, if you are filing the Chapter 13 petition without paying the filing fee, you can ask the Chapter 13 trustee make the filing fee payments to the court from the debtor's first plan payment. If the box is marked yes, you do not need to file an application to pay the filing fee and installments. 
Helen Morris, the Chapter 13 trustee for the state of West Virginia, explains how her office makes the debtor's filing fee payment. The form plan allows the filing fee to be paid through the trustee, and this is a great feature for many debtors because obviously if you're looking at filing bankruptcy, finances, uh, money's tight. So you have to pay the attorney something up front, and if you have to come up with another $310, that may be tough and it may mean that your case doesn't get filed as soon as it needs to be filed. So if, by allowing the debtors to pay the filing fee through the trustee, it's a great benefit to the debtors. And what we do is that we just, we collect the money from the debtor from the plan payments. And when we have sufficient funds, we pay the clerk's office a filing fee and it's done. When determining monthly income for a debtor, refer to Schedule I, Line 12. Line 12 is income after payroll deductions and taxes. Here, these joint debtors have a combined monthly income of $7,049, and this is the amount that goes in the Chapter 13 plan. Remember that it is a good practice to be consistent regarding a representation of the debtor's monthly income between Schedule I and the proposed plan. However, an exact match is not required. Subtracted from the debtor's monthly income are the debtor's reasonably necessary living expenses. To determine this number, refer back to Schedule J. The Schedule J filed with the petition lists all the debtor's monthly expenses. However, in the plan, the number to insert for the debtor's reasonably necessary living expenses is not likely to be the same as the sum total of Schedule J. When completing the plan, I like to use a working Schedule J. On this working version, I have deducted certain expenses that I know will be paid by the debtors to the Chapter 13 trustee. I've deducted the amount for the home ownership expense. I've left the amounts for food, housekeeping, child care, lawn care, and I've deducted car payments I know will be paid by the Chapter 13 trustee. On this working Schedule J, I've determined that the debtors have ongoing living expenses of $4,248. This leaves them with a monthly disposable income of $2,801. This is the amount we list on the Chapter 13 plan. Megan Priest, the attorney for the Chapter 13 trustee's office, explains how she arrives at a disposable income determination. So disposable income is most likely determined by your schedules I and J. So once you have your income, which has all of the deductions taken out of payroll, you're going to take that number and you're going to minus your expenses. What's left over is known as your disposable income. Your plan payments are supposed to be equal to your disposable income. The code requires that the entire amount of your disposable income is devoted to the plan, so you need to make that as close as possible to your plan payments. And just a tidbit on your Schedule J, which is your expenses. If you are making these payments directly, you would include those as part of your expenses. However, if your plan proposes that it is paid through the trustee, do not include those in your expenses. So now in part two, we have income available to make plan payments of $2,801. These debtors will pay that amount monthly for the length of the plan, which in this case will be 60 months. This is because these debtors claim income that is above the applicable median income for the state. If the answer was no, then the length of the plan could be between 36 and 60 months. Plan length is determined by 11 U.S.C. section 1322D. Related to plan length in section 1322 is the applicable commitment period in section 1325B4, which requires a debtor to submit his or her disposable income for the applicable commitment period of the plan. James Voidhofer, a career bankruptcy law clerk in Wheeling, West Virginia, explains plan length and when an exception to the five-year plan requirement may be applicable. Plan length, also known as the applicable commitment period, is set by section 1325B4 of the bankruptcy code. A debtor whose income is below the median income for the applicable state can have a plan of a length as little as three years but up to five years. A debtor whose income is above the median in the applicable state, however, has to have a plan not shorter than five years. The only exception to the general plan lengths mandated by 1325B4 is if the proposed plan pays all allowed unsecured claims in full in a shorter period of time. If a debtor has other payment terms, include them here. Payroll deduction in this district is mandatory. The bankruptcy clerk's office will prepare the payroll deduction order based on the information provided in the original plan. 
If a debtor has other property to contribute to a Chapter 13 plan, list that property here. For income tax refunds, the district's model plan reflects the Chapter 13 trustee's preferred practice. Now, Helen Morris will explain how tax refunds work when filing Chapter 13 bankruptcy in this district. The general rule in the jurisdiction is that the first $1,500 of a tax refund is retained by the debtors and the balance comes to the, the estate for the distribution to creditors in the case. The refund is based on an overwithholding, so therefore from the beginning of the case it was property of the estate. The determination was that the debtors needed to retain some of the refund because there were always expenses that come up that are not dealt with in the uh, Schedule J. In our jurisdiction, we also allow debtors to retain their tax credits. And I want the cases to work and that the debtors have a fresh, fresh start when the case is over. So I don't want to strap them during the course of the case. I want them to be able to complete it, get their discharge, so we don't go after the tax credits. For the effective date of the plan length, most debtors choose the date of the first plan payment, which is due 30 days after the filing of the petition. This next section is a payment analysis. There's nothing for you to do to complete this section. However, notice two things. First, the trustee's fee is based on 10% of the gross plan base. We will speak more on that topic later. Second, payments not otherwise specifically designated under various sections of the plan are all dedicated to the payment of unsecured debt. This number will have to be positive at the end of the plan for the plan to be feasible. Feasibility is a requirement for confirmation under 11 U.S.C. section 1325A6. It means that the debtor will be able to make all payments under the plan and to comply with the terms of the plan. Josie Lugo, a bankruptcy law clerk in Wheeling, West Virginia, will now explain what it means for a plan to be feasible. A plan is feasible when a debtor has the financial ability to maintain reasonably necessary living expenses, to maintain ongoing monthly payments to the Chapter 13 trustee, and the plan payments are sufficient to provide positive cash flow to unsecured creditors after other payments are made under the plan. If a plan is not feasible, it cannot be confirmed. Of course, a debtor's budget, like their life, is dynamic and not static. Mathematical precision on feasibility is not required when things happen in a debtor's life, like a pay raise, the plan can be adjusted upward. When unforeseen circumstances happen, such as the birth of a new child, a medical emergency, or temporary loss of income, a confirmed plan can be modified and adjusted downward. Feasibility just means that at the time of confirmation, it is more likely than not that the debtor can perform the proposed plan. Part 3 is dedicated to the payment of an individual's secured debts. Section 3.1 is where a debtor lists direct pay obligations. Direct pay obligations are payments that are not made to the Chapter 13 trustee. For example, if a debtor is making car payments to MNO Bank and does not need to cure an arrearage because the debtor is current, the debtor can continue to make ongoing contractual payments directly to MNO Bank while in Chapter 13. Notice the amount of the monthly payment and the number of payments remaining. Because this is a direct pay obligation, the debtor will no longer have this expense in month 50 of the plan. That is why this debtor included an additional $220 a month in step payments for months 50 to 60 of the plan. Here, however, this was only included as a demonstration and we will delete this information. Section 3.2 is for the cure of arrearages and maintenance of ongoing payments. This is a primary reason why most debtors file for Chapter 13 bankruptcy, to cure arrearages on a house and car and maintain these payments over the life of the plan. Todd Johnson will now explain how the right to cure and maintain works in practice. Many people will file a bankruptcy to stop a foreclosure or stop a repossession of a car. If they file a Chapter 13 and they want to keep their home and their vehicle, they can propose to pay those loans through the Chapter 13 plan. With a vehicle, they can pay the loan off at preferred terms, even if they're past due. They can pay a lower interest rate. They can pay it over a longer term. Sometimes they can pay less than what is originally owed on the vehicle. With a mortgage, typically if there's a past due amount, that past due amount plus the regular monthly payment can get paid through the plan. And so when they come out of bankruptcy, they're current on their mortgage. Include the creditor's name, the collateral, 
and the amount of the arrearage as of the date of the petition. When the trustee is curing an arrearage on a secured debt, the trustee will also make the payments on the secured claims. These are the ongoing maintenance payments. Chapter 13 allows a debtor to pay the arrearage at 0% and maintain the ongoing contractual payments. If the number of payments is less than the plan length, change that number here. Note that as we add amounts payable in the plan, our payment analysis changes and there is now less money being paid to general unsecured debts. Section 3.3 are claims that are not subject to valuation. However, a debtor can modify an interest rate to the Chapter 13 rate, which periodically changes. This section can be advantageous. For example, if the debtor has a contract rate of interest in excess of the Chapter 13 interest rate, in this instance, this debtor will pay approximately $2,325 less by including the payment in the Chapter 13 plan than if the debtor continued direct payments on this debt. Including this debt in the plan will result in a lower monthly payment and less amount paid over the life of the plan. In determining whether a cost savings exists for including a secured creditor in this section, you also have to weigh the cost of the 10% trustee fee on plan payment. Refer to the payment analysis when the plan is completed. If this number is still positive at the end of the plan, it might be better for the debtor to include the debt in the plan. If this number is negative, that means the debtor must find more income or reduce expenses to make the plan feasible. Let me take a moment to explain the Chapter 13 interest rate. At the time of this filming, the federal prime rate was 3.5%. Now it has changed, so be aware of this change during the video and when filing. This rate is based on a 2004 decision by the United States Supreme Court, Till v. SCS Credit Corporation, 541 U.S. 465. In this case, the court said that the Chapter 13 interest rate is based on the national prime rate plus an adjustment of 1 to 3 percent. To find the federal prime rate, you may go to a website such as fedprimerate.com. If this plan were filed at the time of this video recording, the federal prime rate is 5.5%, and adding a 2% risk factor results in a Chapter 13 interest rate of 7.5%, which would be the amount used in the Chapter 13 plan. Section 3.5 is for the valuation of secured claims. In this case, the debtor owns a truck and owes $22,000, but the debtor can value the truck in the Chapter 13 plan and pay the actual value of the truck at the Chapter 13 interest rate. In this district, the court determined that automobiles have a presumptive value based on the average between the NADA retail and trade-in values. For example, if the vehicle were a 2016 Dodge, one way to determine the presumptive value is to take the rough trade-in value and the clean retail value and divide by two. Let's take a look at how this works in practice. Here in the Chapter 13 petition, the debtor files a Chapter 13 plan. Then in Section 3.5 of the plan, this debtor wants to value a 2016 Subaru at $20,000. To do that, the debtor files a motion to determine the secured status of the automobile and serves the motion on the affected creditor. Then the bankruptcy clerk's office issues a notice to the affected creditor that gives them at least 21 days to object to the motion. I know that this notice states 23 days, but that is to account for a potential two-day delay in mailing. Then, in this case, there is no timely response, and the court entered an order granting the motion to value. In this district, all of this takes place outside the plan and before the plan is to be confirmed. Very briefly, let's look at a second mortgage strip-off in a Chapter 13 plan. Now, David Skillman tells us his interpretation of Sen Penn v. Hansen and how he conducts his practice. When a strip-off of a second mortgage would be appropriate in a Chapter 13 occurs when the value of the home is only equal to or less than the amount of the first mortgage. So let's pretend we have a, a home that has two mortgages, a first and second mortgage. The first mortgage is $200,000 that the owners owe to the bank and the second mortgage is $50,000. If the value of the home is $199,000, then the home itself is underwater. It, its value is less than what is owed on the first mortgage. That means the second mortgage is wholly unsecured. There's no value in the house 
above what is owed on the first mortgage to secure that second mortgage. So that second mortgage can be determined to be unsecure and then not paid in full under a Chapter 13 plan. It can be paid at the unsecured rate, whatever the unsecured dividend is. Now, let's take that same scenario, but the house, the fair market value of the home is $201,000 and the first mortgage is only $200,000, but the fair market value of the home is $201,000 and we still have that second mortgage for $50,000. That one single dollar of equity in the house that the homeowners have secures that entire $50,000 second mortgage and under that circumstance you would not be able to strip off the second mortgage and it would be eligible to be paid in full in the Chapter 13 plan. You need to get a really accurate assessment of what the fair market value of the house is. Basically get an appraisal, a good appraisal, to see if it's even worth trying to strip off. Let's look at an example of how this happens in practice. In this case, the debtor's attorney filed an adversary proceeding that seeks to value the property and strip off the second lien under 11 U.S.C. After the complaint was filed, the clerk's office issued a summons to the debtor's attorney. The attorney then served the summons. No timely answer was received by the clerk's office. Clerk of court entered default against the defendant for failure to appear and defend and filed a motion for default judgment. Then, when there was no timely response to the motion for default judgment, a proposed order prepared by counsel was sent to chambers for consideration. And as appropriate here, entry. Again, all this was done before confirmation of the Chapter 13 plan. Some of you may wonder why this was done by an adversary proceeding and not by motion. Bankruptcy Rule 3012 says a determination of the value of a claim can be pursued by motion. Rule 7001 governing adversary proceedings states that to determine the validity, priority, extent of a lien requires an adversary proceeding unless it is proceeding under Rule 3012. The reason that we just showed an adversary proceeding to strip off a lien is due to a 1995 case from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, Sen Penn v. Hansen. All right, next I'd like to talk about the bankruptcy court case of Sen Penn v. Hansen, a 1995 case from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And this is what the majority opinion said in that case, was that you have to avail yourself of the bankruptcy rules, such as Rule 7001 and Rule 3012. And what these rules do is provide for notice to the opposing party so that they can prepare a defense and defend their interests in court in front of the bankruptcy judge to get a determination on if their lien has a secured status or is unsecured. You, can't, you just can't write it in your plan and expect it to happen. And routinely, in my cases, when a strip-off is appropriate, I use the bankruptcy rules to file an adversary proceeding. When I file these, if it is very clear that the property is so far underwater that the creditor has no chance of proving their case, they usually roll over. They either call and say, hey, we'll do an agreed order agreeing to have the lien stripped off, um, or they don't even file a response and it goes out on default judgment. And then, as long as the creditor, the debtor, gets through the end of the plan and gets a discharge, that second mortgage will be released. If the debtor, for some reason, doesn't complete the plan, uh, and converts to Chapter 7 or just has their Chapter 13 dismissed, that strip-off is inoperative. It doesn't work. Section 3.6 is used in the avoidance of certain judicial liens, like the valuation of secured property, and requires a separate proceeding. First, the form to avoid a judicial lien is on the court's website. In this case, here is the filed motion to avoid a judicial lien. The use of the court's form with the attached abstract of judgment. Once the motion is filed, the clerk's office issues a notice to the judicial lien holder. If no timely response is received, the court reviews and, as appropriate, enters the order prepared by counsel. Section 3.7 is used for the surrender or sale of collateral. Like property valuation and judicial lien avoidance, sales take place outside of the Chapter 13 plan, and sales are listed here for information purposes. 
Here, the debtor is surrendering an ATV to the secured creditor, and the debtor should make arrangements with the creditor. Part 4 of the plan is for professional fees and other priority claims. As previously noted, the Chapter 13 trustee's fee is calculated at 10% of the gross plan base. The Chapter 13 trustee's fee is actually less than 10%. Staff attorney Megan Priest explains why the rate used in the plan is 10%. Now, Megan Priest will explain the 10% trustee's fee and how it works in practice. The 10% trustee fee is the statutory maximum that the trustee can charge. This is the total operating expenses for the office. We do not receive any government funds. These fees go to paying the staff, paying the trustee, the staff attorney. They also go to the expenses that you have that arise from a case. So, for example, all the checks that we would mail out. The 10% we do as a flat fee because the percentage can fluctuate throughout the case. If you have a three-year case or a five-year case, that fee could fluctuate at any time. So it could be, currently it's 8.5%. That could increase up to 9% any day. And we would be required to pay that 9% from then on. We allow this as a cushion um, because that way, if we have the extra money, we're not required to go to the debtor every time that the percentage changes and ask the debtors to change their plan payments. This allows us also a little bit of wiggle room if unsecured claims come in or if we get post-petition financing or post-petition fees. It allows us a little bit of cushion so we're not requiring a modification every time. One way to obtain the actual Chapter 13 trustees fee is to visit the U.S. Trustees Program website, means testing information, schedule of actual administrative expenses for West Virginia. Here we see at the time of this video the actual fee is 8%. Section 4.3 is used for attorney's fees. Insert the total amount of the attorney's fee subtract any amount that has previously been received, and the remainder will be paid by the trustee in the Chapter 13 plan. Generally, if there's enough funds, these attorney's fees will be paid in full on confirmation. Regarding trustees' fees and fees for debtors' attorneys, refer back to the payment analysis. Remember, a debtor is paying their disposable income into the Chapter 13 plan and it may not matter to the debtor how much of the fee is dedicated to the Chapter 13 trustee or to the debtor's attorneys, so long as the return to the unsecured creditors is a positive amount. If a debtor has domestic support obligations, list those in Section 4.4 if it is the intention of the debtor to have those paid through the plan. If, for instance, this debtor had a $1,200 arrearage, and had ongoing monthly support obligations of $300 a month, both of these could be paid by the Chapter 13 trustee. If they were current, then the amount of the ongoing support obligations should be included in this number to provide a lesser amount for disposable income. Section 4.5 is used for other priority debts as defined by 11 U.S.C. Section 507. Section 507 lists debt that are entitled to priority in the bankruptcy code. First are domestic support obligations, which are already dealt with in the plan. Second are administrative expenses. These are generally Chapter 13 trustee fees and attorney fees. Then an eighth priority are allowed claims of governmental units, generally tax claims. If you are not sure that your tax claim constitutes a priority claim, you can try to make sense of this provision. Also, in Chapter 13, the discharge does not apply to taxes of the kind specified in 507A8. Therefore, it's very important for a debtor to include tax claims in their Chapter 13 plan. And if they're not sure if a tax claim is owed, it is likely a good idea to list the IRS or the state tax department to force that creditor to file a proof of claim. Tom Fluharty, an attorney in Clarksburg, West Virginia, explains when a tax claim is dischargeable in bankruptcy. Section 507 of the Bankruptcy Code lists all of the priority debts. Generally speaking, priority debts are unsecured by definition. They are generally speaking, non-dischargeable, and in a Chapter 13, they must be paid in full inside the plan unless the creditor agrees to some alternative treatment. Income taxes that are due in the three-year time period prior to filing and not assessed within the last 240 days are priority. Another way of viewing that 
is to try to determine whether or not the taxes are dischargeable. Typically what I do is I contact the Internal Revenue Service and get a tax transcript from them to see what has been filed. If the tax return has not been filed, then it's not dischargeable. If it's only been filed in the, the last two years, it's not dischargeable. And if it's for a tax year that ended within the last three years, it's not dischargeable. One way of looking at it, the question you ask yourself is what returns are now due? For instance, 2015 taxes would be due and payable on April 15, 2016 without any extensions. Since we're more than three years beyond April 15, 2016 at this point, April 15 taxes might be dischargeable and therefore not a priority debt as long as they were filed more than two years ago and as long as there's been an assessment, that assessment is more than 240 days old, you have to have all of those. I've been asked to discuss a couple of different issues. One is how the state tax department in West Virginia estimates claims where returns have not been filed. And the way they do that is they review a taxpayer's tax history and they determine the highest liability quarter or period that's on file. And then they, they go above that, they essentially juice that number up. When you look at a proof of claim filed by the state tax department as an attorney, if it has a rounded number, an even number, such as ten or $15,000, then it's likely that's, that's just an estimate, an assessment by them. I sometimes call them Jeopardy assessments. If it's an odd number, like $7,459, then that more likely is a number that's based upon an actual calculation or an audit. So if you have a number that is an even number, it's likely that the return has not been filed and, and those returns have to be filed because the liability is so high when they estimate it like that, it makes the plan unfeasible or taxpayer's future very difficult. The most typical debt or tax that you find cases is an income tax. And the best way to approach that is to contact the Internal Revenue Service. You have to get either or two different forms that will allow them to provide information to you. One's a power of attorney and one's to, to receive tax information. There's a hotline number for attorneys with Internal Revenue Service. You can call that. You can talk to them on the phone. You can ask them for a fax number to fax the document to. You can fax the doc to them. They will receive the fax and they'll return the information to you pretty quickly. Other than that, it, it sometimes is a very laborious and time-consuming process to get tax documents. Section 5.1 is for direct payments on unsecured debt. Here, the debtor listed a student loan creditor at a payment of $325 a month, and the debtor intends to continue making post-petition. Under 11 U.S.C. Section 1322B, governing the contents of a plan, the plan may designate a class or classes of unsecured claims, but may not unfairly discriminate against any class so designated. In this district, bankruptcy judge Flatley held that student loan creditors could be a separate class in a Chapter 13 plan on the basis that the aim of the bankruptcy code is to afford a debtor a fresh start. Congress expressly chose to favor student loan debts over unsecured debts, and the exception to discharge for a student loan is not based on the bad conduct of a debtor. Finally, there is a strong public policy favoring the nation's student loan program. In some instances, it is possible to discharge a federal student loan by showing that repayment would constitute an undue hardship on the debtor. In practice, however, this statutory standard is very difficult to meet. In Section 5.2, the debtor may cure an arrearage on an unsecured debt, such as a lease, and to maintain contractual payments for the plan. Section 5.4 concerns unsecured claims. Notice that the estimated dividend to unsecured claims is not completed. There is nothing to do to complete this section. This estimated dividend will auto-complete once the liquidation analysis is completed at the end of this plan. In Section 6.1, the debtor has the opportunity to assume leases. Any lease that is not specifically listed here is rejected. In Section 8.1, a debtor has an opportunity to put any non-standard provision in the plan. These are provisions that do not fit within any other class in the plan. For the liquidation analysis, you will need to refer to Schedules A, B, D, and C. The liquidation analysis is part of the plan because, as a requirement of confirmation, the value, as with the effective date of the plan, must be at least equal to what creditors received if the case were filed under Chapter 7. There are two payment provisions in confirmation. One is the best interest of creditors test, which measures the outcome in Chapter 13 as compared to the outcome in Chapter 7. Second is the disposable income test which requires the debtor to pay what the debtor can afford to creditors over the life of the plan. For the liquidation analysis, include real property listed on Schedules A, B, 
the amount of liens on Schedule D and any exemption claimed. Complete the same process for motor vehicles. For other assets, list the large value items, such as lawsuits or retirement. And for smaller items claimed on AB, you can lump them together. The purpose of this form is only to inform the Chapter 13 trustee of what assets might be pertinent in a Chapter 7 case. Here, the debtor has non-exempt equity to liquidate in Chapter 7. However, assume this debtor has a $50,000 non-exempt asset. So, in Chapter 7, this value would be paid to creditors. We can subtract a Chapter 7 trustee's commission and we have an amount payable to general unsecured creditors. In Chapter 7, creditors would receive approximately a 54% distribution. Here, in this plan, creditors are only estimated to receive a 41% distribution. To keep this item of property, this debtor would need to pay more to creditors in the plan to ensure that creditors would be at least as well off as they would be in Chapter 7. In completing the liquidation and analysis, almost all of the information should auto-calculate and the estimated dividend to unsecured creditors should appear in Section 5.4. Mike Claggett, an attorney in Bridgeport, West Virginia, explains how to calculate the Chapter 7 attorney's fees while in the Chapter 13 liquidation analysis. Now when we come to litigation, we kind of look at litigation in the Chapter 13 kind of various ways. We may provide for it in the Chapter 13 plan that we're going to we could exempt part of it and we can't exempt part of it. So that kind of forces us to kind of set some sort of a value because sometimes we'll put a value as unknown and kind of let it slide through the liquidation analysis, exempt part of it, and then address it inside the plan, you know, how we're going to do it, or, or, in, or by way of petition. So, in other words, what we do is we do it the old time way, where we actually sit down and we actually look at what we're going, what we have, and then divide by 0.9 to come up with what kind of numbers we're going to have to, to pay under the Chapter 13. But it's all a simple case of just looking at what they would get in a Chapter 7 and, and handling it accordingly. Now, as far as attorney's fees go, obviously, attorney's fees, somebody has to represent them in that personal injury case. Generally, it's not us because they already have an attorney that's well into it or some other kind of litigation. And we'll have to hire them to represent the estate and the or the debtor is debtor in possession. And those attorney's fees, when we set the value, we're already figuring out some kind of a net value. At least that's what I do. Other people may not, but I set a kind of net. So that number that I've set as an asset and maybe run it through my liquidation analysis is some, my best guess of what we might get after the attorney's fees and everything else. So in this short video, we've covered a lot of Chapter 13 topics very quickly. If this is your first time completing the Model Chapter 13 plan, it's not easy. Many law students, law clerks, and new-to-bankruptcy attorneys struggle with completing the plan. Over time and with familiarity, it becomes much easier, and you may be able to complete the plan in as little as 10 minutes. For the first time, however, you should expect to spend several hours working through the plan. If you are watching this video because you want to file a Chapter 13 case on your own, you should know enough now not to proceed without an attorney. Filing by yourself to save a house or a car should be the last resort, not the first. If you have further questions about how to complete the Model Chapter 13 plan, you can call the Office of the Bankruptcy Clerk or the Office of the West Virginia Chapter 13 Trustee. However, we cannot answer legal questions. We can only assist you with matters that are procedural in nature. So before you call, make sure that your question is an appropriate one.